Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Lori Kroger, and I'm the president and CEO of Pandora Org. And we are excited that you have joined us today um, for a webinar with Dr. Nancy Klimas. And I, first of all, for those who don't know much about Pandora, I wanted to give you a little bit of an understanding of what we do. Um, I have both fibromyalgia and ME, or chronic fatigue syndrome, and um, so I understand what um, people go through when they have these illnesses, and we also um, just understand what you're going through as far as... Um, I'm sorry, I'm a little tired here. <laughs> But what I'm trying to say is that you are at the heart of everything that we do. Um, we're the only national organization that focuses on research, education, and we have patient assistance program. We think it's very important to fund research for a cure. Um, we understand that the government does not fund chronic fatigue syndrome or ME very well. And so we think that it's important to um, help private investigators and fund research um, on a personal level. And then we also have education programs. That is our advocate extraordinaire, where we teach people how to talk to the media, um, also how to talk with your physicians. We have um, education programs as far as, um, they're called empowerment groups, and we have a few of them here in Michigan um, locally. And if there's anybody who would like to lead one in other states, please let me know and we can help set that up. And then we are the only organization that does patient assistant programs. We have Pandora or Delivers. And that is where, on a short-term basis, we send fresh meals to somebody who's maybe gone through a, um, a severe relapse. Maybe they had surgery or they were hospitalized and have come, come home and they're having a hard time cooking for themselves or caring for themselves. And so we have um, meals delivered to your home on a short-term basis. And um, we also have a covered and love quilts program. And again, those are for people who are maybe going through a hard time, having a hard time dealing with um, the, the illness, both physically and emotionally. And these are such isolating illnesses um, that you can just feel very alone. And we want to, to let people know that they are being thought about and that they are not alone. And um, our Covered in Love program um, sends quilts to, the, to people, and we have a dynamic team that does um, the quilting. And I always want to give a shout out to them because they dedicate their time, donate their time for that. And we also have a prescription discount card. Um, and you can find all of these programs on pandoraorg.net. So if you want to find out a little bit more about us, you can go there um, to, to see. Um, today, let me see if I can get my screen. My screen isn't switching, of course. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Um, <clears throat> today, we have the privilege to hear from um, Nancy Klima. She's the director at the Institute for Neuroimmune Medicine at the Nova Southeastern University. And I believe that's in Davie, um, Florida. Um, Pandora made a major shift towards funding 
Um, like I said before, our government only spends five million for ME research and 11 million for fibro research. Um, we are hoping that with the IOM report, with the um, P2P report, that that is going to shift the sands and having uh, more research funding go towards ME so we can get up to snuff as far as getting closer to um, treatments, for finding a cure, finding what causes this illness. Um, but we feel that it's really paramount to fund private researchers so they can continue their critical work. Um, <clears throat> and at the end of um, Dr. Klimas's report, her research report, um, we are going to have a UCaring, which is a crowdsourcing fund, funding page that will be open for you to go and make donations to her research. 100% of your donations will go to, to her research. We're a nonprofit organization, so you're, it's also tax deductible. Um, again, Nancy Klimas is a professor of medicine at Nova Southeastern University. She's the chair of the Department of Clinical Immunology and Scientific Director of the um, Institute for Neuroimmune Medicine. She has a lot of accolades and um, I've met her personally. She is a doll. She's down to earth um, and she does all this important work for us. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to unmute her and this might take a few minutes while we figure out how to change the presenter so nancy can you hear me i hear you just fine can you hear me okay yep can you okay, hear me i'm going to change the presenter so there should be um That's looking good now. Can okay. You, you can what's see happening? that. Did I lose the... You're the presenter. Okay, there we go. Show my screen. Can you see it okay? Um, I don't see it yet. Well, we're about to find out because I lost your screen when you switched. But okay, well, maybe I'm just... Oh, oh yours was hidden. Let me... Mike, can you see Nancy's screen? Yes, I can. Okay. Yay, All right. that's good. Yay. Good news. <laughs> so that means everybody can see my screen except me. I'm seeing it on my screen, but not on the broadcast. Correct. So um, that's fine. Well, anyway, thank you so much for inviting me to speak with you and with the people that were kind enough to sign up for this webinar. Um, I was asked to focus on our, what we're doing in research, in clinical research, um, so that you could get a sense of the excitement that we have here at our program and why we think we're, we're um, moving with momentum. Um, this first slide is just a slide of our blue ribbon ceremony that we had just two years ago in the right in front of my office right there. I'm sitting behind that window there right now. And that's all the important people at the university, the trustees and the dean and various members of our team here um, being excited at this grand opening. And I bring it, I put it as my first slide because really it's an amazing amount that we have accomplished in just a little over two years since we moved here to Nova Southeastern University and started gathering our research team. Let's see if I can make my slide advance. Oh man, it's not advancing. This is interesting. Oh, there it goes. Now it's, it's doing it off my um, mouse. So we have um, basically three sets of teams here. We have a clinical team, which does both clinical care and clinical research. We have a laboratory team that does both clinical laboratory support of our clinical program and other providers in the country's clinical programs. We do specialty laboratory testing for 
this illness and these illnesses. Um, but it's also a discovery laboratory where we're working on biomarker discovery. And then our, our third group um, is the computational biology team that is working with all of the elements of our group, the clinical team, the laboratory team, the animal modeling team, and all of the genomics uh, work that we're doing here, and putting it all together into a single massive database where they model the illness. It's very exciting, and I'll talk more about it in a bit. So this slide that you're looking at here is showing you the clinical team where we have Drs. Ray and Dr. Vera and myself, the, the three um, clinician physicians, as well as Irina Rosenfeld and Violeta Renseca, who are clinician nurse practitioners. So we have five clinicians in our program. Connie Soul, an exercise physiologist, um, research associates that, that help us with both the research and clinical care, um, and our amazing clinical research group led by Elizabeth Balbin and, um, and incorporating a number of members of our team as we do clinical trials work and clinical research. We also have office managers, uh, Kestia and uh, Vimory are, are office managers and try to make this uh, well-oiled machine that's operating on a mini budget somehow still operate despite uh, its complexities. A laboratory team is, is led by Dr. Marianne Fletcher. She is an endowed professor, the Schemmel Professor of Immunology here at our institute, and she directs the Discovery and Diagnostic Laboratories. We moved this laboratory from the University of Miami uh, just a year and a half ago, not quite, and um, they have uh, relocated here to the Nova campus in Fort Lauderdale and uh, continue their laboratories at the Miami VA. Dr. Marianna Morris joined our group also just barely, not even two years ago. Um, she's a uh, person who's an autonomic nervous system expert, uh, meaning the, the part of your body that controls your blood pressure and pulse and respirations and all these kinds of things. And she does animal modeling, and she's particularly interested in, in um, the effects of toxins on the brain and its effect on autonomics. So she's uh, very engaged in that kind of work. Dr. Nathanson joined our group from the University of Miami. She's a genomics expert, was just awarded a new uh, grant just this last week. She's excited. She's got an epigenetics grant, newly funded. Paula Waziri is our, our cell biologist. She's really looking at the viral cell interface and how latent viruses affect cell function. It's very exciting work. It has some very innovative prospects for interventions. <clears throat> Louis Salguero is a veterinarian who works at the VA in our Animal Modeling Center with Dr. Morris. And then we have this splendid group of, of uh, laboratory experts uh, that are running the laboratory in all, of its expert, uh, in all of its aspects. The laboratory, like the clinic, is an integrated program where it's doing both clinical and research every single day. So the team, there's no one member of the team that's just research or just clinical. They're all doing everything all of the time. It's a great group of people. The computational research team is led by Dr. Gordon Broderick. We recruited uh, Dr. Broderick from the University of Alberta just about two years ago now. And his partner, Travis Craddock, who's a, a young investigator and uh, doing splendid work here. And their team is a growing team. Uh, these guys are engineers and physicists and computer scientists and programmers and they just bring a lot of different types of skills to the team and, and they, they use these huge, huge computers, these, these supercomputers to throw our massive data sets into and try to, in a, in a way that I really think is extraordinarily innovative. It's not being done by any other group in any other disease. They're using um, a, a novel way of, of, of making the data uh, fit together. They're using chaos theory, if anyone out there does math and physics. They use chaos theory to make all this massive amount of data find its linkages and see where the homeostatic um, basis of illness is. The, the concept here is that when you were well, you had one 
big network of complicated normal human physiology going on with the immune system and the endocrine system and the brain and so on. We're all communicating with one another and keeping you in a certain balance and it was a healthy balance. But now in this chronic ill state, you have a different set of of things going on, different different communications between all these systems, and and it's also reached a very comfortable for it balance of homeostasis, but it's a homeostatic sick space, so you're sort of stuck in the sick space, sick space, and these guys mathematically model how to get you out of that and back into the normal space. It's kind of crazy, wonderful. It's it's really terrific, and if you go to our website. You can see Dr. Broderick talking about this in our recent uh, patient conference. It's very, very exciting work. Our institute, it was developed, we all came from our different universities. We've been collaborating, but we thought we'd be more effective if we were all together under one roof and working in the same space. Part of this is because if you're a computational scientist, if you're a laboratory scientist, and you actually get to see patients, you're much more motivated to stick to it and get us to the, the end game, which is intervention, and not get too distracted by the cool new knowledge you keep discovering and all this data that you're playing with all the time uh, and go off in, the, in some other direction. It sort of snaps you back to, hey, these people are waiting for you. Stay focused. Let's take care of this illness. We'll, we'll take care of other illnesses too someday, but this is our... These are our illnesses that we're working on right now. And so um, it's neat because these, these folks that are here at the Institute get to interact with patients all the time and the clinicians that care for them and their families that, take, that, that are worried about them and so on. And it really um, it not only makes them strive to, to get there, it is also very rewarding for them to see that what seems like very esoteric stuff has really important uh, payback that in, in, in their careers in their lifetimes they're going to see the work that they do actually matter to to someone and that's going to be I can't tell you for a scientist that that's what we all work for that's that's it's not about money or grants or the numbers of papers it's about knowing that in the end of the day that you made a difference so the the Institute mission statement is to advance knowledge for patients with these complex conditions and that it's an integrated program one where we don't separate the clinical and the research and the educational missions that they're all integrated thoroughly together you'd be hard-pressed to be a student in our center and not come away with knowledge not just about the clinical care but the, this, the type of research that's needed to do the, to to um, make the field progress in the kind of work that we're doing and we also work as a platform for international collaboration. We offer what we have to, to our colleagues in the field. If, if we want to do a multi-center study, we have a beautiful um, platform called REDCap that, that holds all the clinical data, and we share that with our colleagues. We gave our platform as, as we developed it to um, the group in Canada that was developing a, a, a um, integrated clinical research site and they got theirs up and running before we could get ours up and running that was pretty impressive but we have this really cool uh, setup where we can share and try to advance knowledge nationally and internationally both from our clinical data sets our computational approaches our core laboratory and so on so I don't have to tell you all what chronic fatigue syndrome is. I'm not going to even try um, because you live in it and you know it and uh, you can teach the rest of the world about that. Gulf War illness you might not know as much about, but if you're living with chronic fatigue syndrome, put on a uniform, come out of that uniform sick, and you got Gulf War illness. Because what happened with these Gulf War folks is that they went in healthy into an incredible incredibly toxic environment, extraordinarily toxic environment. It was a relatively short war, but in that course of that, that exposure of the before war, during war, and cleanup, they were exposed to tremendous high levels of pesticides, 
the oil rig fires, there was depleted uranium in their environment, they had sarin gas exposure, they had um, infections, sand, um, a number of different types of things that happened in a very short window. And you took these, these athletes, these active duty, super fit people, and one third of them came back ill and stayed that way. 20 years later, they're still sick. And so anyone with chronic fatigue syndromes could certainly relate to how someone with Gulf War illness feels and our obligation as a country to respond to their illness with, with as good a science as we can get to get clinical care to them. Now for those of you with chronic fatigue syndrome, you might also realize that you're benefiting from the Gulf War illness experience. You heard from Lori that there's only $5 million being spent in a year on chronic fatigue syndrome by the NIH and the CDC. In Gulf War illness, the DOD budget is roughly $20 million, and the, the uh, budget at the VA is not quite that much, but it's close. So there might be $35, $40 million a year spent to try to understand Gulf War illness and to deliver it effective interventions. There's a lesson to be learned here, those of you who are advocates. The DOD pot of money comes from the CDMRP, the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Division of the Department of Defense. This says that your politicians required the DOD and then encumbered money for this purpose each and every individual year since the Gulf War so that this work would be done. The Congressionally Mandated Research Group, or sorry, the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Group um, has a law, look it up, it's, it's amazing what their, their list of, of science is that they're funding, breast cancer, autism, many things that don't seem quite so directly military, but, but may actually matter. I mean, women that were exposed to these toxins may actually be at higher risk for breast cancer and so on. So it might actually be a service connected in some way. Nonetheless, the the, the, whether it's service connected or not, the DOD is mandated to spend the money that is directed to them by Congress on specific diseases. And that money comes from Congress. So, so think about this, my friendly advocates, as you're out there um, trying to find better ways to get funding for this that the DOD is happy to spend that money once they have it, and they are great at directing these programs. The Gulf War Illness Program, if you look at it, you, there is a, not just a pathogenesis and biomarker discovery piece, but there is a phase one study mechanism, there's a phase two study mechanism, a phase three study mechanism, well funded. Because uh, truthfully, when you put a general in charge of this stuff, they, they, they approach it, as a, how are we going to solve this problem? Let's, let's solve this problem. And if you look at the way they're going at it with, with this at the DOD, they're doing that in a very efficient fashion. The VA, too, has really stepped up, and they're really moving in this game. So, so take some, some advocacy lessons from the veterans and wonder how it is they convince their congressional, um, their congressional representatives to put earmark money for this reason. We did have chronic fatigue money in this budget about three years ago because the, um, the advocacy work from the, the CFIDS Association, when it was called that, had done that work. Um, but it was put in a long list of other illnesses. There were like 14 medical illnesses in the list, and they didn't have to fund any one of them at any particular level. And everyone competed for the same, I remember how much money, it was four or five million dollars. So it didn't go very far, and it was only available one year. So it takes not only um, some serious political know-how to, to pull that off, it also takes annual, every single year, going back, going back, going back, and for persistent uh, yearly funding. So consider uh, the, those strategies. I'm not the world's wizard at making that happen, but, but I'll tell you that it's a door that opened for Gulf War and made an enormous difference. Back to our group, we have this unique approach where we integrate, as I said, and we use that computational biology core with everything else we're doing to model the illness 
And what's very neat, and this is what we have already in our hands, a virtual model of chronic fatigue syndrome and a virtual model of Gulf War illness where you can play with the model by inserting various drugs into the model and seeing if they change the homeostatic set points of everything in the model. So basically you can do a what Gordon calls an in silico clinical trial and, um, and test a lot of things in this virtual platform to get your best intervention in your hands, preferably um, with, with not just um, what drug might be useful, but what combination in what time course. If you try to change something, say, in the immune system for X amount of days, and then you come in and tap the endocrine system, is that a better way to reset homeostasis than to just put the pressure on the immune system? Can I work on neuroinflammation on one hand and work on you know, viral reactivation or some such thing on the other hand? So, so there's a lot of different ways to approach this, and we, and we do this in our virtual model. The DOD liked it so much, they funded our group for $1 million a year for four years to apply that virtual model to Gulf War illness animals and do clinical trials in the, in the mouse model, get our very best pick out of the mouse model for Gulf War illness, and by year four do a phase one study in um, Gulf War illness based on that virtual model. So here's the DOD approach. They said, look, we're going to fund consortiums. We're going to make people talk to each other. We're going to make integrated groups work well together. We're going to give them enough money to see if they can actually do what they say. And that's what they did for us. And we're thrilled to be there. You know, we're very excited as a group to be in a funding mechanism that allows us to do spend several years fine-tuning our models with animal and uh, laboratory-based experiments before we risk putting potentially toxic therapies into sick people who don't tolerate toxic stuff very well at all. So, so we're trying very hard to come up with safe and effective strategies that would work. Everything we learn in Gulf War illness comes back to chronic fatigue syndrome because every time we improve our modeling system for the one illness, we're better at it for the other illness. So even though we don't have as much money, although I'm not saying we, we, we don't, we are funded to do some of this work in chronic fatigue, but we are so much better funded in Gulf War illness. That, uh, but we're saying that everything we learn in this one area makes this research team better, stronger, more precise, better at predicting, knowing whether or not the model is going to work. So it's, it's a very exciting time for us. So we've put this very innovative cutting edge thinking uh, as a, a linking basic and computational and clinical science together so thoroughly that we can then um, novel these therapy, these therapy uh, we can model these novel therapeutic uh, therapies. And we can use this same platform to be training the scientists of tomorrow and the clinicians of tomorrow to give us better strategies and ultimately um, provide better care for what is a truly underserved population. Speaking of underserved population, O oh advocates, please refer to yourself that way. You are an underserved population and there's special funding for underserved populations. So we have to continuously remind you that if only 16% of the chronic fatigue cases have been identified by their doctors, 84% of the patients out there don't even know they have this diagnosis. They're so underserved they haven't been to a provider that knows how to diagnose them. And of the 16% that have been diagnosed, they've had a hell of a road to get care. So here's our mission again, clinical care, clinical research, laboratory research, computational research. Under clinical care, we have two facilities, one in Miami and one in Fort Lauderdale. Um, they're both outpatient facilities. Uh, the one in Fort Lauderdale is on the university campus. Uh, it's, they're, they're lovely facilities. We're very happy about them. The one in the Davie campus is actually wrapped around our research laboratory, so patients can actually see uh, 
see scientists at work if they care to look through the, the windows of the, the technicians hate it that they feel like they're monkeys on, on, on view. But, but anyway, we do have a way of not interrupting them and still be able to see things going on. Um, and we're caring for patients and we're um, also partnering with the Miami VA to care for the Gulf War illness patients. So this is our clinical team in different aspects. We got amazing, see all the students up in the upper left hand corner, that, that was our, our last year's uh, summer, summer group. Every summer we have a lot of summer students come through here. We also have students all year round. And we have a, a, just a fantastic clinical and clinical research team. Um, in this clinical research, we have studies that have been funded by a lot of different mechanisms. One is the Chronic Fatigue Initiative, which we completed. We helped provide the biorepository that is um, being used by a number of scientists around the country. Most of you are aware of Dr. Lipkin's work at Columbia looking for um, pathogens and biomarkers. But uh, this repository is actually being used uh, by Chronic Fatigue Initiative uh, scientists uh, are all around the country. It's been a, a great resource. The Centers for Disease Control is doing a multi-center study. We're one of those sites. I'm going to go into that a bit. We have our NIH studies, DOD studies, pharma studies. And the thing I'd like to, in to really emphasize is our translational medicine unit, which is all funded by private donation. So this translational medicine unit, um, the idea here was that if you are, um, if, you, if, if our virtual model tells us we need to use drug A and drug B, and we need to do it in this certain time course, and they're safe drugs, they're rational drugs to use, I would love to jump right in and do that. It does cost money to do research, and it's not just a wee bit of money, let me tell you. When we do these uh, genomic studies, every single individual blood draw costs about a thousand dollars and we draw nine blood draws across one exercise challenge nine thousand dollars worth of lab work to get all the data we need on that one individual that's in that study that gave us the the virtual uh, platform data that we needed to do this kind of computational biology so we're spending some bucks here trying to get this work done and when we do a targeted approach that comes from our virtual model we have to repeat that, that uh, computational thing we did where we put people on a bicycle and drew their bloods before, during, and after the exercise repeatedly and measured all the genes that got turned on or off in response to the exercise challenge, all the cytokines that were expressed, the hormones that were expressed, the different kinds of immune cells that changed what they were expressing as they circulated. All of this data went into our computational models so that we could come up with this, this homeostatic model that we're so proud of. But if I want to now do a study based on that, I have to do that again before and after the interventions to see whether or not it actually changed, not just how the patient felt, but how, whether or not homeostasis actually changed. So this is the exciting work where we're, we're right there. We have our targets. We're on it. We were so keen to do it. But when you apply to the NIH for this, and remember with chronic fatigue, all we've got is the NIH. We can't go to the DOD. When we apply to the NIH for this, we write our grant. We submit it. We wait. Let's see. I submitted a grant last September. It's going to be reviewed next month. So that's, how long is that? Six months between the time I submitted it. When they review it, they'll either say they love it or they hate it. Usually you never get a grant the first time. They almost always hate something about it. So you have to revise it. It goes back in, usually the following September, for another review in March for funding in September. So that two years came and went by the time my idea went from the grant to having the dollars to do the study. So that's why we push so very hard for, for donation-based translational phase one studies, because we can cut two years off the time it takes to do the science if we are start from a donation pot. If I have that phase one data, then I can go to pharma or I can go back to the NIH or someplace else for phase two, but I'll have all this really strong data in my hand. I'll be really in a much better position 
to get that second study. But the first studies, while they are expensive, aren't nearly as expensive as phase two and phase three studies. And so we try to do those if we possibly can from uh, private donations. So you can see in the top here, we have two basic translational medicine pieces. We have an autologous stem cell study. We're going to get off the ground on the strength of a single donation. One of my patients is fully funding this study, which is very exciting. We're going to do 15 patients um, with an autologous stem cell approach that has helped several people um, in the practice. It didn't really come from our modeling, but we're excited about at least testing it and seeing how it impacted our model. So we're going to be doing that. And then our targeted therapies based on our model, I sort of glob that all together, because there's more than one approach there. So we'll just be picking them up. As we have funding available, we'll do the first, the second, and so on. We were funded by the NIH this just a few weeks ago, actually, um, to do our targeted therapies approach in a laboratory setting on the cells. So we have an in vitro testing where we can go through all of these experimental approaches of ours, but in a cell-based model, again, to pick out the very best, we have about 25 different types of things we'll be testing there, and we'll pick out the best of those 25 to go forward for um, phase one in human. Again, always trying to spare you all the risk that comes with being in a study when some of the therapies may be toxic. One of the other issues about getting private donations to sponsor this is what if the best therapy is some generic, easy-peasy thing that needs to be added into the formula, but you would never convince a pharmaceutical company to do that because they're not going to make any money. So, so it's perfectly rational to think that we will come up with interventions. In fact, I can tell you we are coming up with interventions that are based on generics or based on, you know, very potent supplements that enhance, say, mitochondrial function or that type of thing. And so, um, but, but in combinations. So how am I ever going to get that funded? Pharma is not going to fund that because then there's no money to be made. I could make it a big bunch of intellectual property and try to make up some, you know, NSU neuroimmune medicine magic pill. But that's not fair to you either. I, if this stuff is, is inexpensive and, and available, what I would like to do is get that science done so you have access to the best possible therapies as soon as possible. And if we tie it up in intellectual property stuff, then you guys won't see it for years and years and years. So we're very motivated to get this stuff pushed out, find, get the science done, do it safely, but do the exciting stuff. And, of course, we, we're relying on donation dollars in large part to do, do that. Uh, but the proof will be in the pudding, and I'm hoping to prove it to you. So then, you, then you'll be even more likely to fund our science as we go along. Now, we do have some pharma-sponsored stuff. KPAC's immune study was just uh, completed. You'll be hearing more about that. They should be releasing their data um, uh, April or May-ish, I would expect. Uh, they'll have their analysis done and submitting their paper. Um, I, no one knows the results yet if the blind is still there. Amplogen, uh, as you know, has been an ongoing battle. I'm hardly going to discuss that, but there is this big open label study going on right now that the FDA has asked them to continue to do, and we are a site for that. Um, we're going to be doing this phase one stem cell thing I talked about. The CDC um, has a series of studies going on here and uh, something like 11 sites, I think. So um, that's exciting. I'm going to talk a moment about that and then our DOD program that I referred to. Um, we also are doing new this year, and this is also entirely sponsored by as much as we can by smoke and mirrors and a little donation money. We're going to create a division of environmental medicine here at our institute. Many of you have seen environmental medicine doctors before, and you know that they come in many different uh, flavors, ideas, treatment types of approaches. Our group has um, been adopted by the American Academy for Environmental Medicine because we are going to provide the first um, on-site fellowship for environmental medicine. We're creating a, a, this fellowship program. It's, it's a long process, but we will create this process in partnership with the VA because the VA 
understands that there are many toxic exposures our veterans have been exposed to and that we have an obligation to do better care and that they would like us to train a generation of doctors that could do so. And so this is very exciting to us um, and we are hard at work at that. Uh, and it, it and opens some new doors that I haven't discussed of potential interventions that we will work very hard to evidence base so that it could become uh, treatment guidelines in the future. Um, we also have these uh, biomarker discovery studies, one for the CFI, the biorepository and the microbiome study. The CDC has a biomarker um, discovery program as well and we are providing um, samples to them through the volunteers that have um, ag agreed to be in their studies. We have 75 adults and a number of kids, I think 10 kids in our, in our CDC study at our site, but they have a much larger group nationally. Um, we have an NIH study to look at uh, microbial translocation. That's the whole leaky gut thing that you all hear about, about whether or not bugs are crossing the gut and wall and causing a lot of immune activation. Dr. Fletcher is the PI of that study. She's also the PI of the Biomarker Discovery Project that was funded by the NIH. And Dr. Nathanson, this brand new epigenetics study. Our computational biology team is just um, kicking things out of the park. Our original study was with women with chronic fatigue syndrome and um, men with Gulf War illness. We quickly discovered that there are very big gender differences in the homeostatic networks, big surprise, men and women are different, but it affects their illness in a very significant way. And so just in the last uh, six months or so, we have been funded to do the other gender of each of those. So now we have a men with chronic fatigue uh, study that we're recruiting and a woman with Gulf War illness study that we're recruiting, which will allow us to do beautiful cross comparisons of of women and men within each illness and across the two illnesses as a comparison. We also have a fibromyalgia comparison group. Very exciting work. Um, our, our laboratory research, um, as I described the microbial translocation and biomarker discovery work, um, and the epigenetics and genomics projects that we're working on. Our computational biology work, um, those if look at the um, little box in the lower left hand corner and you'll see a scatter pot of little green and blue and yellow and orange dots. That's a healthy control and the little dots are at the bottom is before exercise and the middle is during exercise and at the top is four hours after exercise. And in a healthy control there's only two little lines that are connecting any dots at all. There's not very much connectedness there. But in Gulf War illness in this one on the left side you can see everything, all these connections. And if you actually looked at what they are, the very bottom one, I can hardly read it myself, I believe that one is um, IL-1, it's an inflammatory cytokine. When it kicks off with exercise, it touches a series of immune activation dots in the green, black are neuropeptides, yellow and blue are hormones. So you have these, um, one inflammatory cytokine kicking on this huge amount of response across all these different systems and then four hours later tremendous more responses and when you look at the the genomics uh, pathways with that you can see at the beginning with this little autonomic immune kick that's exercise that we get a tremendous amount of inflammation in 15 minutes and by four hours we have oxidative stress we have pain pathways we have mitochondrial dysfunction we have signaling abnormalities, we have, oh, it goes on and on and on. We have all the symptoms of what is Gulf War illness. Our chronic fatigue syndrome model looks very similar, slightly different connect the dots, but very similar and very useful. So you can imagine what we did with this um, diagram here was we said, well, if IL-1 is so important, why don't we propose blocking IL-1? There's a drug that does that. Well, we had this slide in our hands five years ago, and I have not been able to get that study funded. I have submitted it six times to six different funding agencies or revised it or whatever. It has not been funded because it's just, just so very difficult to get the um, phase one work funded. It's, it's, if, if I had done the phase one and I was asking for phase two, this wouldn't be a problem. 
but instead I'm asking them to buy into first that the illness is serious enough to use drugs that you would use in rheumatoid arthritis. Now for you and I, that's a no-brainer. Of course it's serious enough. You're not even working today. You're listening to me. You're sick. Of course you deserve biologic response modifiers if they would work. But I couldn't get that past the review board. That's the sticking point. Are you sick enough to deserve serious therapy? So without phase one funding from private donations, I'm saying I lost five years here on this when I had an obvious target for treatment. And I've had to come around back at it using much less aggressive modalities. And I think I'll get those funded. But I have not been able to pick the obvious one, the biologic response modifier that blocks IL-1. That makes so much sense. It exists. It's, it's, it's FDA approved. It, I'm not allowed to touch it. So that's the frustration. And you can hear it in my voice. How crazy can that be? But that, how exciting that our data points at the spot. How cool is that? So that's the kind of stuff we're doing. So I'm going to quickly pop through because I know we're going to, you guys have questions. The CDC study, um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because you can find it online, um, but it is a very cool study. It's, I think this is the third year. They're trying to develop a longitudinal database of a huge number of patients and kids that come to, to expert clinics rather than um, being uh, random digit down community samples. And they're going to compare the kind of stuff coming from these clinics to their random digit dialed stuff to see um, how things differ and also have a larger data set to look at subgrouping strategies and so on. Um, there's a lot of adults in this study. Uh, I don't remember the, app, the number, it's many hundreds. Um, and healthy controls, uh, they added the kids in last year and now they're adding fibromyalgia in for a comparator group. Um, they ha this year added the exercise intervention. A lot of people grumped because it wasn't a two-day, but quite frankly, um, the one-day exercise challenge is going to give us great data, and it was too late to even consider a change. These things take years to um, filter through all the IRBs when you're working with so many sites. So I'm very happy with the exercise study, the way it's designed, particularly since it has cognitive testing before and after. And the cognitive testing is... Um, I can tell you in my own practice that I do this all the time this way and we get very clean data. So while you might get more with the two-day test, the one-day test is going to show us something and, and I'm not too worried about it. They've also made a real effort to get homebound cases and brand new incident cases so we can get people at the earliest stage of the illness. And there's a recruitment is 18 to 70 unless you happen to be a kid, in which case it goes down to... Uh, kids, where are their kids? Sorry, I lost them, my kids. Ten, to, 10 years old. So you can go down to 10 for the kids, 18 to 70 for the adults at the time of recruitment into the study. And, um, and it's very comprehensive. Um, and we're doing these um, exercise challenge studies to look at the mediators of illness and homeostasis. As I said, we've had four of these studies. We finished the men with Gulf War study. All the other studies are still recruiting. We're almost done with the women with chronic fatigue, though we still need a lot of fibromyalgia in there. And um, the men with chronic fatigue and the women with Gulf War, we're just getting off the ground. The women with Gulf War, we're going to add a functional MRI piece to it, which is very exciting. So we're going to put them on the bike. Um, and do a before and after the bike image of the brain to see if anything changes that would suggest increased neuroinflammation. So that's very exciting stuff. Um, we have a biomarker discovery. We have a bunch of stuff. I'm always writing grants. Last year we wrote a ridiculous number of grants. We actually got a bunch of them and now we have to do a whole bunch more work this year. Oh my goodness. It's exciting, but it's a lot of work. Um, this is the men with Gulf War illness and the women with chronic fatigue study. Women with Gulf, sorry, men with, <laughs> I, that's a typo, folks, sorry. Men with chronic fatigue syndrome, volunteers needed. Not, we done with Gulf War. I just did that about 10 minutes ago and screwed that up, sorry. Um, and the um, 
Men with chronic fatigue and women with GOL4 it intensively recruiting and the fibromyalgia study. So this is a general number just to add, if you are interested in our studies. Some of our studies actually do have some travel money if they come from a federal source and we we're able to put some travel budget in then um, there might be some travel money, particularly uh, the woman with Gulf War illness study. I know we're going to have to recruit those beyond uh, South Florida to get a number, the right number of patients in. So you can always call this number or go to our web page or go to our Facebook page and ask more questions and find out more. This I showed at our patient conference, uh, which we had just two weeks ago. This is one of my patients who feels like she's 100% better now. So she went skydiving. So this is a great uh, test of chronic fatigue syndrome. Since we know that autonomic um, excess triggers inflammation, if you can get through a skydiving event and you still feel well the next day, you don't have chronic fatigue syndrome anymore. And that's what happened for her. So I put this up as one of the pictures of hope. People who do get better have faith. She was a super, super ill housebound person. And she's much better now. So that's exciting. So go back to our web page. Oh, by the way, if you know people with those kind of stories, I want to hear them because I'd like to actually put together a collection of all better people and how they got that way and put together their book or a web space to tell those stories. Because I think those are great stories and they give people hope. So send them my way. You can connect me through the, the uh, web page. But I'd love to hear those stories. So I think that's it. And I stand ready for questions if you're still out there somewhere. Okay, yep, yeah, everybody's still out here. Um, if you want to <laughs> change presenter back to me, so if you go on the right-hand side where it says screen sharing, and there should be a little button that says change presenter, uh, change it back to me. <laughs> let's see if I can, I can stop showing my screen. I can start that. And then change presenter, found you. And then go back to Lori. There we go. Yes. Got you covered. All right. OK. So there we go. Boy, that was certainly a lot of hopeful information. Um, and you're doing a lot of great research. Um, before we get to the questions, I just want to say I'm going to keep this um, screen up here. Um, we do have a live um, website right now on the youcaring.com. And I, to make it easy for you to remember how to get there to fund Dr. Klimas, it's um, the HTTP um, colon backs, two black backs slashes bit.ly backslash funclimus. And again, those um, dollars would be tax deductible and 100% is going to research. And Pandora Org is also going to be throwing money in that pot um, to help fund her research because we think that it's really important. Um, some of the questions that we have here, I'm going to have to find them. Here we go. Um, well, first of all, I want to make a few comments. I think that um, the generics that you're doing with the, the generic medication is really good because, as you know, a lot of patients um, aren't working and generics are affordable for us. So I think that that's, that's really hopeful. Um, and then also with the gender differences, I think there is a huge, men and women certainly are different. So I think that it's great that there is a research, research going on with the gender differences. As far as the environmental um, medicine, is any of that, is that just with um, environmental toxins that were um, our soldiers and people were exposed to in Gulf War, or is it also going to be including um, like mold? You know, it's a great question, and molds are most certainly an important issue. So, 
the reason why we were attracted to environmental medicine is that there's two big areas in environmental medicine that felt like they rang true to chronic fatigue syndrome, particularly, even more so than Gulf War. One was the mold toxin, the mycotoxin story, mm -hmm. which is rarely worked up. We see tremendous damage to the immune system in chronic fatigue patients, and yet there's very little work on whether or not mycotoxins might have played a role. And there's treatments available for mycotoxin exposure. So, so we thought this deserved a, a much more thorough evidence-based approach, which is what we offer. Is, and here we are in the academic center, and we set up to do science. That's what we want to do. Here is a field where there's a lot of well-meaning doctors who are that are working from their experience, their art, and some some really good science that set up the field. But they don't necessarily have a lot of, uh, even less funding, if you can believe it, than, uh, than chronic fatigue syndrome. And so the, the state of the science for their work is a little, uh, either too small uh, numbers of subjects in the studies, or they're not uh, placebo or controlled studies. They're either big case series, or they're really little studies. And so they just need some real good science going on to help them. So this mm -hmm. mycotoxin thing is really cool work that, that's got some good science started up. It's certainly encouraging. We've all heard stories of patients who discovered after the fact that they were po being poisoned by the homes they lived in or the exposures they had to molds at some point. And these are molds, not just any molds, but molds that are known to put into the air toxins that hurt the immune system. And so they can be very um, difficult to, to um, be sure whether or not they're in your house or not. So you actually you know, have to do some studies to figure it out. So that's kind of cool. That's a good, good area that we can really help people. The other I'm really intrigued by is this concept that you can induce immune tolerance to a specific antigen. So for the longest time, environmental medicine docs have been doing sort of an allergy approach to to um, inhalants, but also to food allergens, and then they, they delved into chemical sensitivity, and, um, and they were immunizing people in a way that, that by a large case series, <coughs> excuse me, um, they were getting clinical responses to this, <coughs> sorry, this, this immune therapy it's very homeopathic in its, in its dosage strategy. Very low dose, very, very safe way to approach it. And if it were mm -hmm. able to be helpful, that would be really cool. <coughs> More recently, they have approached the microbiome abnormalities and tried to induce tolerance to gut flora. And there is even a guy um, that's doing... Lyme disease, Lyme bugs, like um, the, the BCA and all the, the Lyme-associated bugs. <coughs> and he's immunizing in a way to induce tolerance, <coughs> to reduce the inflammatory drive in response to uh, these, these bugs in post-Lyme chronic fatigue syndrome and claims in a case series with no controls to have seen clinical responses. So I'm very intrigued by the, the idea that you could <coughs> figure out um, what's driving all this inflammation we see and then quiet it down with an immunotherapy approach. I would be really excited to be able to, 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 to make a contribution in that area and evidence-base some of those observations if they're true. And, and I would love to prove that. So mm -hmm. that's why I got intrigued by it. I thought, well, here's a... You know, a lot of our patients have gone down the road to see a lot of different types of environmental medicine docs, and they, they all treat. There's not a. I'm 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 also impressed by the diversity of approaches in the environmental medicine field. But when I, I've been to um, <coughs> in the meetings and talked to experts, and and I will say, there's some really amazing people in this field that have dedicated their lives to trying to help people with these environmental sensitivities. Mm -hmm. But the patient population um, often overlaps heavily with the chronic fatigue population. 
So I'm excited. You know, it's one aspect, not everything we're going to do, but I'm, I think it deserves to have a division and some faculty leadership and a plan, both a research and clinical plan, and to put it into place at both the VA and at the university. And that, that's, that's our intention right now. Well, I'm th thank you. I'm thrilled about that. Um, I had a mold exposure um, over the, the summer, and it literally knocked me to the ground. Um, so I'm ecstatic about this. Um, there's a lot of questions coming in. I'm going to take them as they first came. Um, um, we're not going to have time for all of them. Um, but somebody wants to know what is the um, best supplement or medicine to help increase NK cell activity? That's such a good, good question. At first, I, I didn't mention in my talk that if you go to our webpage, which was there, it's uh, nova.edu slash NIM for neuroimmune medicine. Um, we had a patient conference just a few weeks ago, which focused on cellular energy and the kinds of things that enhance cellular energy. So it's pretty cool. It was a great, great, um, great group of speakers, and it'll all be posted on our webpage another week or two. So come back to the webpage and look. But the reason why I brought it up because that they were all talking about supplements. So there's two different approaches really to try to enhance NK cells. I'm sorry, there's three. There's first. What can you do that in the literature would say this enhances cytotoxic cells? We use um, a, a pharmaceutical called Immunovir that's available out of country or it's in country sort of equivalent called Inosin or Inosin. Immunovir had a phase two study done in chronic fatigue syndrome in Canada a placebo control study, and one of the observations was that it enhanced NK cell function and it seemed to correlate with um, clinical improvement. So that's when we started it. We have since uh, presented repeatedly large case series and have continuously applied for funding to do placebo control studies. We have one of those in right now, so we'll see. But um, anyway, we like that one. Um, the Japanese have done placebo control studies using mushroom extracts. The, the glycoproteins in certain mushrooms are known to enhance um, NK cell function. John Chia's um, equilibrant, which he, which he formulated as an antiviral, actually has the mushroom extracts and other NK cell enhancers in it. He, he was being thoughtful in his formulation, so there's another option. So one thought is to go to supplements that we know enhance NK cell function. Another is to go to supplements that are aimed at enhancing cell function, meaning can you get more energy out of a cell? And that, uh, again, I would direct you to our webpage to look at the things that are known to enhance mitochondrial function um, because we have some lovely nationally recognized speakers on that that uh, spoke at our last conference. And then finally, you say, well, what on earth wiped them out to begin with? Why are they so exhausted? If you look at these NK cells, they, they don't have enough of the enzymes inside to do the cell, the killing of their targets, either because they exhausted them, they used them all up, or they can't keep up with the demand. So the other approach is when you can find an infection that is requiring the NK cells to activate, for instance, HHV6 infection or something like that, treat it help the immune system quiet down the, the um, amount of virus it has going after to attack so that it doesn't use up all of its resources. If you reduce the viral burden, presumably you will also help the immune system um, recover enough of its resources so that it can be more effective. Okay, great. That's great to know. Um, this person would like to know, is the vagus nerve being researched at all? Yes, the people doing the vagus nerve research um, are Gudrun Lang and Ben Nadelson in New York and New Jersey, and I would direct you to their, their work. They've been doing some really cool work with vagal nerve stimulation and other things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, have you virtually tested rituximab in Dr. Broderick's ME virtual model? <laughs> that is so unfair. Uh, 
I don't know. I know that he's doing those things right now. We just got the genomics data into the platform in the last couple of months, and I, you know, it's not just pushing a button. When I asked Gordon a num uh, question like that, he says, "I'll get back to you," and he puts five supercomputers online for four or five days to answer a question like that. It's just okay. an amazing amount of computational work, but it, they're doing it, which makes me very excited. I I will say that that some of his therapeutic targeting points at things that, that I would have picked out from my clinical experience, so that's nice. It's sort of validation, and then some of it tends to be surprises. For instance, all the inflammatory stuff is an obvious target, and it shows up time and time again in his uh, modeling. Um, and the poor uh, Th1 cytokines, which are the ones that promote NK cells, and the overexpression of Th2 are the ones that express um, antibody, which rituximab would be inhibiting. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I would say his model is at least pointing in that direction. But the other thing about his model is pretty much it says you can't get away with just one thing. We have to do at least two things at once. So doing these clinical trials, one thing at a time is probably not destined to be as, as, as um, successful for a long-term fix as pushing more than one homeostatic button at a time. That's what the, the virtual model would say. And that's exciting to know because that's not how we usually design studies. Okay. Okay, good. Okay, this kind of, there's two questions that kind of piggyback off one another. Um, how long do you think it will be before some of the interventions you refer to become known to the patient community, either officially or unofficially? Okay. And then someone wrote that they've been ill for many years, they're now in their 60s, is there going to be a time where they will ever feel well? And I think those two questions go hand in hand. Yeah, and I, and I feel your frustration at the pace of science. So I want to be both encouraging but also realistic in my answer. Um, encouraging because we see people get better who've been ill for a long, long time, you know, and I can't say every patient walks through his clinic is going to feel better, but I will say that determination matters and willingness to keep trying matters and, and, and flipping things. That's why I said this idea of having a patient recovery website um, is such a cool idea because if I look at my patients and say, what do you think makes you, the ones that have recovered, I say, what, 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 what is the core, you know? Well, in our hands, because we're an immunology group, you can imagine that we spend a lot of time trying to boost NK cells and, and quiet inflammation and control infection and, and all of that. And, and that's pretty cool. But when my patient walked through the door, the one that's going to fund the stem cell project, and said, I've been sick for a very long time, and everything you've tried, Nancy, has not worked on me. So I found this guy that does this weird stem cell thing, and I'm telling you, I'm... I'm great now, and I haven't been great in a long time. And I just had to sit down and say, okay, I don't know everything. I want to hear what the hell happened with this stem cell thing. What was that? So, so sometimes Eureka's come through the side door, you know? And mm -hmm. I still don't know because she didn't see me before the study, so I don't know what changed um, with her stem cell thing. That's we're designing a study to do before and after stuff and see whether it fixed her adrenal function. I mean, I don't know what's going to be the target of those stem cells. It's not, it didn't come out of our, our virtual modeling. It came out of her, oh, by the way, I'm all better. I have a patient in Hawaii who's better on a fifth of my usual dose of the immune stimulant and uh, a minor, minor dose of an antiviral. And moving to Hawaii where she got out of her mold environment and, and she was hugely housebound and now she's very capable of being upright and having a full and complete day. Well, what was that? She had two little minor tweaks and a change in venue and, and that's, that made her better. So everybody I think should feel some hope about, about the fact that there, there is the ability to get better 
and that we have to find the right combination for that patient. Now in terms of our science, how long is it going to take? Um, that's why I'm so anxious to get these phase ones kicked out of the park so we can move on to the, the bigger stuff, the phase twos and phase threes. But a phase one takes about a year. A phase two takes about a year and a half, two years. If you're, if you're aggressive, you might be able to do it in a year. Um, and then you're on phase three. Now, if it's a bunch of generic medications you're using, a phase two, if it's safe, will change the standard of care. And it will become accessible because that will be published and people will be able to read it and say, oh, well, that's something I'm willing to do to a patient if it's, if it's you know, using safe combinations of things. But generally, you need a phase three um, to, to get an indication from the FDA and usually two phase threes that you can do them at the same time and you can do them in two different countries. So if you're really enthusiastic and can get the backing, you can do your phase three work rather aggressively and you could conceivably go from a phase one to the end of a phase three in a five-year window. If it's considered an orphan disease, and there are some arguments to call the subgrouping strategies of chronic fatigue syndrome orphan, you only need one phase three, in which case things just are that much easier and certainly a lot cheaper. So, so uh, I mean, I don't know if you want to put a timeline on what all this means because we have to get some of this phase one stuff funded. But, uh, but I'm encouraged that we have the targets, that we have a very innovative approach, that we have a very motivated team, and we have you, the motivated patients who want the intervention. So we have everything we need except money, you know? Except Bottom the line. money. Yep, <laughs> except the money. Okay, um, this is going to be the last question. I know that it's been a little over an hour, and we usually can only do an hour to hour and 15 minutes before we kind of collapse. So... Um, <laughs> If you had to make one treatment recommendation for ME-CFS patients today, what would it be? Oh, man, that's so unfair. <laughs> <laughs> I'm picking the tough ones, you know. <laughs> one treatment recommendation, so individual. You know, for the average type A, the first thing you'd say is, for Christ's sake, pace. Because the worst thing patients do is when they finally feel a little bit better, they get up and try to do their whole list. And that's just incredibly foolish and for some reason people um, do it time and time and time again so for you type A's out there that have a good day for Christ's sake make it like a quarter of a day and then pace 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 and try to extend it out um, in terms of interventions as in things you take um, I would say our Inus and Immunivir trick has probably been one of the more promising things. doesn't work for everybody, but it has helped. It has made some home runs happen. So, um, and that's a not too difficult thing to get, at least the Inosin over the counter. If you want to read about that, pull up that old Canadian study. You could Google um, isoprinosin, chronic fatigue syndrome, and uh, you could pull up that old um, Canadian study, or you could go to Newport Pharmaceutical. They have it on their webpage and it shows how they dosed it. Be a little careful with those kinds of strategies because they're proteins. They're just amino acids. They sound so innocent, but they're, um, they kick up your immune system and then you feel inflammatory for a little while, which you already do to begin with, so it feels worse. And then you feel better afterwards. So it's sometimes better to ease up on it with low doses and try to get to the recommended dose instead of going straight at it. And the other thing about that is um, we dose that five days a week, as they did in that paper, um, partly because the immune system likes to see things in pulses. It works a little better with pulse, pulse kinds of treatments. But also because if you take it each and every day, um, it's a protein, and it breaks down into uric acid, which can cause gout or um, renal stones. So you got to hydrate very well. And um, But it's an over-the-counter prep, Inosin, so it can be had. Look for the gluten-free kinds and be aware of that lovely new report that suggests a whole bunch of over-the-counter stuff is bogus and you want to try to go to the most reliable source for your supplements as possible. Mm -hmm. Y'all okay. might not have seen that, but about two weeks ago the state of New York um, did a random pull off the shelves of some very respectable places and had the most disappointing 
uh, quality assurance tests of what's in standard supplements. Some of them had like your local house plant in it and not even the supplement at all. So be aware that there's some really poor quality stuff there and you want to be buying your supplements from a reliable place that does quality assurance studies on their products. And I like um, companies that have a third party right. look at quality that's, assurance. That's ideal. And, and even there, you wish they would pull them off the shelf and not be given the lots, you know. You'd like, mm -hmm. you'd like to, as, as, as independent a, as possible a quality assurance process. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, again, we thank you very much for you um, taking time out of your busy schedule, Dr. Klimas. Um, we know with seeing patients and doing all this research um, that you are a very busy person, uh -huh. um, <laughs> to say the least. It's the truth. <laughs> and, and for um, all of the people that joined us through the GoToWebinar, um, we appreciate you being there. Again, if you want to fund Dr. Klimas, you can go to the um, bit.ly um, fundclimas.com. It's tax deductible. We will be giving, um, Pandora Org will be giving towards this also. Um, and remember, no matter the amount that you give, it all counts. Um, every dollar is appreciated. And in our last, um, with Dr. Younger, there were some people that gave $2. And we were just as thrilled with that. So um, we appreciate that. And if you would like to make any donation towards Pandora Org through, for any of our patient um, yeah, our, our patient, uh, what do they call those? <laughs> See, we're past the hour and a half, hour mark, and there I go again, right? Services, services. The patient assistance programs, um, you can go to pandoraorg.net. And pandoraorg is all one word and .net. So um, I am going to be ending the webinar and thank you. Um, watch for our, on our Facebook page. We will be posting a link to the funding and also to the recording. We'll be putting that on our um, YouTube channel um, within the next couple of days. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye-bye.